Eric Ten Hag has become one of the most sought-after managers in Europe, first truly catching the eye of many during the 2018-19 season when Ajax was playing some champagne football in the Champions League. Now, they're back to beating up on teams at the continental level and lead the Eredivisie after an imperious 5-0 defeat of the closest rivals competitively, PSV. Hey, I'm Adrian, and in this video, I'm extremely excited to be speaking to Mark Geschwind, a co-founder of EIF and an encyclopedia of knowledge when it comes to Ajax in general and Ten Hag in particular. Do be sure to give him a follow on Twitter, linked below. A shout out to people like Earl and Vonell who suggested this video to me on Twitter when I made a call for submissions. Be sure to reach out to me on Twitter with your ideas for a video as well. Now before we get to this conversation with Mark, here's an extremely quick crash course on Eric Ten Hag. Eric Ten Hag is a former center back turned football manager when he took on an assistant coaching role at Dutch side Twente upon retiring as a player. From there, he moved on to PSV once again as an assistant before getting his break as a manager at Go Ahead Eagles in 2012. He did well at the club, managing in the second division of Dutch football before getting signed to coach Bayern Munich's second side, Bayern Munich 2. At Bayern, he would work with Pep Guardiola, ensuring there was continuity from the second team to Guardiola's first team. Ten Hag has previously said that, quote, every day I get to work with Guardiola. I look forward to it. He inspires me. After leaving Bayern Munich, Ten Hag joined one of the clubs he previously played for, Utrecht, and managed to lead them to a respectable fifth place in his first season. In his second, he did one better, finishing in fourth Europa League place. And with how well he was doing in the Eredivisie, well, let's bring in Mark. What was his reputation in the Netherlands prior to joining you guys? Was he expected to be sort of the next big thing as far as Dutch coaches go? Yeah, so when he first joined, people were pretty excited. He was actually one of the main candidates to take over before Kaiser actually took over from Peter Bosch in the summer previously. People knew he had a very good reputation. He had worked with like Pep Guardiola at Bayern Munich, but people were a little concerned about like how he dealt with the press. Um, to this day, he's a little bit stern and maybe just a tad bit awkward, not really the most like personable guy in the entire world. So people sort of always thought that it might not be the best fit at Ajax where, you know, the press is constantly on, on top of you and, you know, everything is so demanding. So that was always like the one thing that people would say about him. We got over that and particularly because we were having a tough season with Kaiser in the beginning of that 2017 2018 season. So we thought, you know what, let's go with the guy who we think has probably the best coaching pedigree that we could hire and brought him in. And I think there was still an air of uncertainty into, in terms of, you know, what formation he would play, would he just default to, you know, the Ajax 4-3-3 because he had had this reputation for being a little tactically flexible at Utrecht and not sticking to one system in particular. So there were some question marks coming in, but I think for the most part, people were excited to see uh, what to do and always were, you know, maybe quietly confident that he would do a good job. January 2018, as we mentioned, Ten Hag joins and he ends up losing just two of the 16 matches that he overlooked in the Eredivisie. So what stands out as maybe the biggest changes that he made to the team? And was there any notable change in tactics or approach for Ajax? It's funny because early on, there wasn't actually a ton. I think he was kind of coming to terms with, okay, who is in this squad? What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? And for the most part, you know, he probably didn't want to rock the boat too much by being, you know, making a dramatic change and going to like some sort of different formation that wasn't a 4-3-3 because coming in as an Ajax outsider, that's something that we always take very seriously. It's like Peter Bosch got a lot of scrutiny at the start because, you know, he's not an Ajax guy. He never played for us, you know, didn't come through the youth academy. So we're always a little bit more harsh on those types of managers and always like have this air of skepticism about them. So I think for the first six months, Ten Hag was just like, let's not rock the boat. He knew, you know, nothing he could do was going to get him fired. He always knew he had that continuity insured. So it was just, Let's get some players out there. Let's test some of the, see what I kind of have in my squad and go from there. And so that first half season was a little bit anticlimactic in a way, I would say. Uh, we kind of like stumbled to the finish line. There were like some injuries with Frankie De Jong. Um, there were some questionable sort of performances from some of the players, namely Hakim Ziyech. I remember he got like booed at one of the end of the, um, at the end of the season at one of the home games. 
So it was a little bit tense, but it kind of like just crawled to a finish to get to the summer. And then that's really where the work be at. Some of the personnel that he had at his disposal, of course, we saw in the 2018-19 season, some incredibly talented players. Did he start to look towards those academy players more than the previous managers? Was he sort of picking up what Peter Bosch had put down, in a sense? I think he was basically picking up what Peter Bosch laid down. And I think he knew that he had a good mixture of youth and experience. And I think what he did do was highlight the key players that he really needed to thrive being Frankie de Jong, namely, but also uh, Matthias De Ligt and Donny Van de Beek and Hakeem Ziyech. He really identified the players that he needed to do well and kind of built the system, at least from my perspective. Unsure if this was always his grand plan from day one, but to me, it very much seemed like he saw Frankie de Jong, Ziyech, and probably De Ligt as the three sort of main players and was like, how can I get a system in that gets the best out of these three guys. And he came upon this 4 2 3 1 formation with Ziek playing as like a right winger, playmaker, lots of liberty, freedom to kind of do what he wanted. Frank Young controlling everything in the center of the park, and Matthias Delek just being that rock at the back who he would ultimately end up pairing with the more experienced Daily Blint. And everything started to come together. But it was mainly built, I think, through those three guys. And I really do think he saw Frank Young as the important piece in that. And how do I get the best out of this very unique? you know, NBA term, like unicorn type player, who's a center midfielder, but loves to drop incredibly deep, loves to dribble. It was a unique player to deal with. And I think he saw, okay, we can't pigeonhole him into a three man midfield where he's like more of an attacking midfielder because we want him to drop deep. So will he really occupy those spaces further forward? You can't really play him as like a lone center defensive midfielder because he doesn't, that, that would kind of curtail his own abilities and that he wants to really be creative and drive forward and that would ultimately leave gaps at the back so he centered, centered uh came to this you know double pivot formation where he knew that you know as one went forward one could go back and frankie would have that freedom to kind of do as he please and be like the heartbeat of the team overall so let's jump ahead to this current season now because you know pretty much everyone that you mentioned is gone <laughs> so he lost like quite the spine from his team so how would you compare this side that's now smashing it once again at a continental level. How would you compare this team in comparison to that 2018-19, both, I guess, stylistically and, and in the personnel? Yeah, so as you mentioned, dramatically different, apart from a few, a few key players, but even some of the players who are still here, Daily Blunt, went from playing center back to now playing left back. So there's changes already, even in the personnel. But so stylistically, it's elements that are the same and elements that are different. So something that was very much a trademark of the original, you know, sort of great Ajax team that everyone now uh, talks about, that 2018-2019 team, was really building everything through the midfield. Frankie de Jong, Daily Blint, passes through the center of the field. It was very almost narrow in a way, but using the talents of Donny Van de Beek to receive between the lines, knowing that Ziek is a player who loves to drift inside, and then knowing that you have Tadic as well, who was either playing as a striker or as a left winger who would like to tuck inside as well, that we had lots of central talent and we were able to combine through teams and really penetrate through the middle of teams. Now, although we still had, you know, wide play and we put crosses in and we would overload on certain flanks with Tadic and Tagliafico and Frankie, still elements of what we do now. Now what we really do is build up through the width. We've decided and we recognize that Edson Alvarez, for how many talents he does have, is not Frankie de Jong on the ball. Very few are. And instead of, you know, maybe trying to just replace Frankie exactly, which I think you see some coaches kind of do. The first example that pops into my mind is maybe Pep trying to like recreate Busquets with a Rodri, for example. Instead of trying to find the exact same type of profile for Frankie de Jong, he said, okay, this is what I've got. I have Edson Alvarez. He's unbelievable at winning the ball back. He's not as good on the ball. So what can we do? Let's, instead of building up through the middle of the field, which he probably won't have the capacity to do, let's build through the flanks and try and overload teams on the flanks, create chances that way, and get crosses into the box. So instead, he stuck Dusan Tadic on the left, Daly Blint as a left back, Ryan Gravenberg almost playing as like a left-sided midfielder. It's very reminiscent to almost like that Pogba Juventus role back in the day when he would play like almost as a left midfielder. Three incredibly technical players, like all playing on the left side of the field. 
And on the right side of the field, you got Anthony Masrawi and Berghaus, who's playing as a 10, but he's naturally, you know, more of a right winger. So he kind of drifts over to the right as well. So what you end up with is these like three banks of three incredibly technical players playing on each side with Haller just standing up front, waiting for crosses and Alvarez waiting in the middle where all his job is to shuttle it from one side to the other. Doesn't need to make any daring passes, you know, between the lines, like everyone loves to see these days, just shuttle it from one side to the other, get it to your better ball progressors and like Daly Blint and Lazarawi and Lissandra Martinez and Tadic and Gravenberg, get it to your more talented players. And then we build that way. You don't go down to the middle anymore. It's more focused on the wings, as you said. And does he still use the same shape? Um, and if he does, is that pretty much a guarantee that he's going to use that shape every single match? Or is he a little more flexible than some might believe? Definitely a little bit more flexible. And I think he is the, you know, everyone on, you know, tactics Twitter and analytics Twitter loves to talk about how, you know, formations are just numbers. And I think that that kind of epitomizes Ten Hag because at its core, it is still the same 4-2-3-1 system in theory. It's Gravenberg and Alvarez as your pivot players. It's Tadic on the left, Berghaus is a 10, Anthony is a right winger. So it's still kind of that 4-2-3-1. And you do see that actually when we defend, that it kind of reverts back into that you know more normal shape. But then when we win the ball, it looks a lot more like a, almost like a pep 4-3-3 where Gravenberg and Berghaus turn into like high advanced number eight players, like almost like you would see when like peak David Silva and Kevin De Bruyne were just very high up the field and we're in those wide areas as well. So when we have the ball, it kind of morphs into more of like a 4-3-3, whereas in defense, it's more of a 4-2-3-1, more of that classic formation that we did play back in the day. So I think he is very keen and it was something that you know, I just had tweeted like an hour ago that Ten Hag is flexible and adaptable to his players. And I think that is something that really elevates him for me into that status of like, when you're talking pure tacticians, you know, top five, top 10, whatever you want to consider him to be. I really do think he's up there um, intellectually with, you know, your Klops and your Peps and your Tuchels and all of those coaches. And so this is a lot of praise for the guy. He deserves it. But if you had to point to one of his weaknesses as a coach, because there has to be something, what would it be, Mark? Trust me, I think there's a somewhat decent amount. It's funny because I do criticize him a fair, a, a fair decent amount. And the reason I do it, and it's something that I think he really has to figure out when he gets to a bigger club, is how to rotate the squad effectively and how to try out different lineups and different players. So my biggest grievance with him has always, from day one, been the squad selections and his inability to rotate the team. So going back now, it's like that 2018, 2019 season, he very much almost killed that season. And he was under a lot of pressure because, you know, back in February of that year, basically two weeks before we ended up thrashing Real Madrid 4-1 and then everything was rosy from that point on, you know, we had just had a terrible loss to like Heracles Almelo 1-0. We had just gotten spanked 6-2 against Feyenoord. And it looked like the wheels were kind of coming off a little bit. I think we were like seven points back on PSV. It could have been potentially more than that, honestly, at that point in the season. And everyone was just very pessimistic going into the Real Madrid game. And I remember tweeting, I'm so sick of this guy because he has it in his head that we have to play with a number nine. Casper Dolberg at the time was that number nine and he was terrible. It was no longer the great Casper Dolberg of the 2016, 2017 season, or even the one that we saw at the Euro this past summer. He was just so poor in every single game, but Ten Hag just persisted with him over and over and over and over. And it was so frustrating because we had all seen how incredible our ceiling was when we played in the Champions League, because we would always play Tadic as the nine. We played Tadic as the nine against Bayern Munich in both of those legs. And we ended up, we drew 1-1 away and we drew 3-3 at home. And we looked like we could go toe to toe with one of the best teams in Europe. And then we would come back home domestically and we would know, we would look fall flat. We would lose 6-2 against Feyenoord. You know, we would drop, uh, drop points here and there. And it was almost for me predominantly because he just didn't see how ineffective Dolberg was being and that we just had to play Tadic consistently there. And he just didn't see it. He wouldn't make the subs quick enough. He wouldn't make the changes fast enough. And that's something that's undoubtedly persisted to this day. I mean, last season in particular is another great example where he found his lineup, 
Hilaire came in in January. He was the nine. Clausen was the 10. Tadic was going to play on the left. Anthony was going to play on the right. And he just wasn't going to deviate from it. Europa League, obviously Hilaire didn't get, um, he didn't get like registered. So we'd have to go with Tadic in the Europa League. But, you know, he wasn't using the likes of David Neres and Mohamed Kudus and some of these other players that we just needed to be more match sharp and fit. So that way, when we needed them in a game that we were struggling in, they would come in and they would be ready to make an impact. And he didn't do that. And I think it ultimately cost us in the Europa League when, you know, we were struggling just a little bit against Roma and, you know, Neres and Kudus and these guys, he tries to throw them on and Lasina Traore. Guys, they just weren't ready to play because they hadn't been given enough minutes. And that's one thing that always just bothers me. And particularly now, as we have such a deep squad, I want him to take a little bit of a page out of Pep's book, who loves to rotate and really does give most of his players ample playing time. When you have that deep of a squad, you need to use them. We have older players, Daily Blint, Dusan Tadic. You know, these guys can't play 90 minutes twice a week for the entire season. It's just not possible. But up to this point, he's been very rigid with the squad a couple rotations here and there, like one or two players getting um, swapped out for like air divisi games. But for the most part, that's my biggest grievance. And particularly as you go to a bigger club, you know, it's not going to be sunshines and ro sunshine and roses when you like, you know, you go to Manchester United, for example, and Jaden Sancho is getting zero minutes every single game. At some point, you've got to give him some minutes and you got to get him happy um, because at Ajax, it's a little bit easier. And so my final question for you, Mark, it's August 2022. Is he the manager of Ajax? If you had to guess. I'm going to go yes. And I think it's a risky one, but maybe I'm biased. But I do think that with Wundersar and Overmars and Ten Hag, I think they truly do believe in the project that we're building. I would have been far less confident in this answer had you said the summer of 2020. You know, one year removed from our incredible run, in the Champions League and then we were coming off a very sort of questionable season where like really we didn't even win the league we only kind of got awarded it because COVID hit and we were ahead on goal difference and things seemed to be sputtering a little bit that's when I would have said if a good opportunity arose he might have left I think now unless Manchester United really 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 make like a huge effort for him you know they roll out the red carpet they say, you know, open checkbook, we'll bring all the players you want, we'll give you the freedom to operate for three years, something almost to the level of like Pep Guardiola um, type control, maybe. But do I ever see Manchester United doing that for a Dutch coach who has no affiliation with the club and is not really the most personable, likable guy, doesn't speak English particularly well? Probably not. So I think they're going to keep the good times rolling. I think they'll give him a very nice extension, keep him happy, and he'll be here in 2022. Mark my words. I hope you enjoyed this conversation because I absolutely learned a ton from Mark about Ten Hag. Make sure you give him a follow, especially if you have an interest in the tactical side of football. But beyond that, my name is Adrian. I thank you for joining me, and I hope you have a great day. Ciao. Thank you